In a box not far from ours was Colonel Anna Friedman Goldman, chairman and keeper of the great seal of the Honorable Order of Kentucky Colonels. Not all of the 76 million or so Kentucky Colonels could make it to the Derby this year, but many had kept the faith. And several days prior to the Derby, they gathered for their annual dinner at the Sealbach Hotel. The Derby, the actual race, was scheduled for late afternoon. And as the magic hour approached, I suggested to Stebbin that we should probably spend some time in the infield, that boiling sea of people across the track from the clubhouse. He seemed a little nervous about it, but since none of the awful things I'd warned him about had happened so far, no race riots, firestorms, or savage drunken attacks, he shrugged and said, Right! Let's do it! To get there, we had to pass through many gates, each one a step down in status, then through a tunnel under the track. Emerging from the tunnel was such a culture shock that it took us a while to adjust. God almighty! This is a... Jesus! He plunged ahead with his tiny camera, stepping over bodies, and I followed, trying to take notes. Total chaos. No way to see the race. Not even the track. Nobody cares. Big lines at the outdoor betting windows, then stand back to watch winning numbers flash on a big board, like a giant bingo game. Old blacks arguing about bets, waving pints of whiskey, fistfuls of dollar bills, girl riding piggyback, t-shirt says, stolen from Fort Lauderdale jail. Thousands of teenagers, a group singing, let the sunshine in. Ten soldiers guarding the American flag and a huge fat drunk wearing a blue football jersey, number 80, reeling around with a quart of beer in his hand. No booze sold out here, too dangerous. No bathrooms either. Muscle Beach, Woodstock, many cops with riot sticks, but no sign of a riot. Far across the track, the clubhouse looks like a postcard from the Kentucky Derby. We went back to the clubhouse to watch the big race. When the crowd stood to face the flag and sing, My Old Kentucky Home, Stebman faced the crowd and sketched frantically. Somewhere up in the boxes, a voice screeched, Turn around, you hairy freak! The race itself was only two minutes long, and even from our super status seats and using 12 power glasses, there was no way to see what was really happening. Later, watching a TV rerun in the press box, we saw what happened to our horses. Holy Land, Ralph's choice, stumbled and lost his jockey in the final turn. Mine, Silent Screen, had the lead coming into the stretch, but faded to fifth at the finish. The winner was a 16 to one shot named Dusk Commander. Moments after the race was over, the crowd surged wildly for the exits, rushing for cabs and buses. The next day's courier told of violence in the parking lot. People were punched and trampled. Pockets were picked, children lost, bottles hurled. But we missed all this, having retired to the press box for a bit of post-race drinking. By this time, we were both half crazy from too much whiskey, sun fatigue, culture shock, lack of sleep, and general dissolution. We hung around the press box long enough to watch a mass interview with the winning owner, a dapper little man named Lehman, who said he'd just flown into Louisville that morning from Nepal, where he'd bagged a record tiger. The sports writers murmured their admiration, and a waiter filled Lehman's glass with Shivas Regal. he just won $127,000 with a horse that cost him $6,500 two years ago. His occupation, he said, was retired contractor. And then he added, with a big grin, I just retired. The rest of the day blurs into madness. The rest of the night, too. And all the next day and night, such horrible things occurred that I can't bring myself even to think about them now, much less put them down in print. One of my clearest memories of that vicious time is Ralph being attacked by one of my old friends in the billiard room of the Pendennis Club in downtown Louisville on Saturday night. The man had ripped his own shirt open to the waist before deciding that Ralph was after his wife. No blows were struck, but the emotional effects were massive. Then, as a sort of final horror, Stedman put his fiendish pen to work and tried to patch things up by doing a little sketch of the girl he'd been accused of hustling. That finished us in the pendentis. 